Hello, I want to welcome you to the call. Uh, I am particularly looking at uh, the name T. Boris, T V O R U S. Hi. Hi, what is your name? Uh, my name is Tia Boris. Tia, okay. Yes. Welcome to the call, Thank Tia. You. Where are you calling from? Um, first domain of Bloomfield Hills. Oh, great. Thanks so much. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that uh, we could hear you and welcome you. So thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. We, we have told age well how, how many of their people have been on these calls. They're very pleased to hear it. I see we have somebody from Peconic Landing. Hello, hello, it's Chrissy Viola, TC will see you again. The Thanks for being on the call again. Here's a quick mask. How are you, everybody? <laughs> nice, so I like the flamingo. Your face. <laughs> you like the flamingos? I think they're pretty cool. <laughs> I do like that. <laughs> Gotta stay positive in this environment, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, it's just a few minutes past, so I will go ahead and welcome everybody to the call. Uh, it's nice to have Gil and Sandy back again on the call, and Tia, thank you for joining us, the re and Christy, and the rest of the folks on the call are across the Masterpiece Living uh, Network, so, or, or organization. So, um, just to kind of recap for what we'll be talking about today, uh, we did... Yeah, we did, this is our third session of the three. And so we covered three different topics from Live Long, Die Short. The first section that we covered was of the book was what is possible. And that was a practical approach to lifestyle change. And we discussed things around that. The second part last week, if you were here or if you weren't, it was about the 10 tips. And the section two of the book talks about the 10 tips and how to bring those tips to reality in your life. And uh, Dr. Roger posed the question about what was the 11th tip if we all could choose one. So it, there was discussion about other things that we might add to that as well. Today's session is really about uh, the third section of the book, where do we go from here? And um, I will just highlight the questions that were posed for this discussion. And um, those are two things, we'll come back circle around to them. But one was what is one thing that you would like to change for your children and grandchildren about the aging journey. The second question today was if Gandhi told us, be the change you wish to be in the world, and what can you do to make aging a better experience? So we will circle back around to those, but I just want to let you know we've got a small group here today. So I think if you want to raise a question or have a question, and want to get into the discussion, go ahead and just speak. Or if you're trying to get somebody's attention, raise your hand and we'll, we'll see you and make sure we, we call on you for that. Uh, so I think everybody's been on the calls before to know Dr. Rogers' background. Um, it's a fabulous background. He was trained at Tufts Medical University, uh, school, excuse me, Tufts Medical University School of Medicine and Harvard University School of Public Health. Uh, he worked in the Air Force as a and retired as a full colonel and chief flight surgeon from the Air Force's Surgeon General Office in Washington, D.C. And that was after numerous years, over 22 years of roaming around the world and getting very involved in historical uh, events from a medical perspective. They used his skills and talents there. Uh, he is the current, he is the president of Masterpiece Living and has been over for over the past decade really been focused on what makes aging a better experience and how to support uh, environments that help older adults grow and become really the best they can and really achieve the most they can in life. He's a lecturer, researcher, and consultant, and of course an author, which is why we're here, is to talk about what he's written about. I will tell you, I found out about Dr. Roger when I was looking into um, a variety of companies that worked in wellness and somebody had said you've got to see this guy I saw this guy on a present do a presentation in Washington DC you've got to check him out and uh, they mentioned that a couple times and I went ahead and YouTubed him and checked him out and was fascinated that he was sharing the word of wellness as we age and what we can do about it because so many people weren't focused on that you know that as you age uh, there's a lot you can do to control uh, your lifestyle 
So with that, I reached out and found out about Masterpiece Living and have the fortunate ability to be able to join, have joined the company a few years ago. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up to Dr. Roger to just open the discussion today. And if you wanna jump right into question one, feel free, or if you wanna chat a bit about the third section of the book and what made you uh, write it and look at that angle, we'd be glad to hear from you. Well, thanks, Tracy. That's all very kind. And, uh, you know, most of the, what you said was true about in my background. No, it, it was true. But if it got you to us, then it, it was all worth it. Honestly, we have, our team has been so enriched with you being on it. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Very kind. Lately these days, uh, yeah, it's nice to hear the introduction, but uh, I don't know how uh, the older versions of us on this uh on this call field, but I know as one of them that uh, uh, I, I think the thing that's uh, becoming more important every day is uh, what kind of person are you, you know? And so overall good guy, I would like to add to my, my introduction, uh, but I have to earn it. So <laughs> anyway, enough of that diversion stuff. So uh, the third, the third section of the book, uh, I wanted the book to be very practical right from the beginning. And there are so many books about aging that it actually caused me to delay writing one for, oh, as much as five years. I had been thinking about it, incubating about it. And, uh, and finally, I, I ran into a, a, an excellent senior editor who said, you know, we all have a unique perspective about this. And so uh, that only you can write that. And uh, from my point of view, I th he says, I think you have to. And that got me started. And as a procrastinator, I have to get started. Once I get started, then I'm okay. But getting started is a little difficult. Uh, but I wanted it to be practical. So um, the first part uh, came as a surprise to me. Uh, and that is where I uh, focus so much on our, our history as a species. And that so much of, of what we need and want and find pleasure in and are drawn to are, are really just extremely consistent with how we have lived for most of the time we've been on earth as much as 99% uh, in our hunter gatherer uh, ancestors. And so uh, it explains so much about our behavior, but specifically for this, what it is, what it takes for us to be healthy. So I wanted to address that. And then the whole idea of uh, changing and that can be overwhelming. And I wanted to make that very practical. And with the whole, uh, having uh, found out the whole principle of Kaizen, changing in small steps, had to add that. And then there was the specifics in the middle part of the book, the second section, uh, specific tips. With, with uh, taking that tip and talking about the research and talking about how important it is, but then making it uh, practical, how you might consider working it into your lifestyle. The third part I, I had to deal with, uh, and, and that is, uh, what do you do with all this? You know, my brother was on the MacArthur Foundation in the, in the uh, 80s, when the MacArthur Foundation was, were doing, they, the foundation was doing their 10 year long study on aging. And uh, that had been prompted by Jonas Salk he had said, let's find out why some people just seem to age in a better way. And they spent 10 years doing that, as most of you know. Uh, but my brother was uh, privileged to share a cab ride with Jonas Salk uh, after they reported their results in the early 90s. And it was Jonas Salk who said, well, we found out a lot, but now what are we gonna do with it? It's important that we apply what we have learned. And, uh, and in a small way, that's what I was trying to do when we took one in this third section, as we talked about what the future might hold, you know, if I were to be an observer, what might happen, but even more so, and today, uh, these are the questions that I'd like to, to deal with. What does it mean for me personally, all of you, meaning me, so all of us, what, what does it mean for all of us? because uh, I love that quote from Gandhi that, uh, you know, be the change that you want. And so what is our role in this as older adults, but even for those who, uh, who are associates working with older adults and as someone who has a pulse, <laughs> because we're all taking this journey together. And some of us are, are, are earlier, uh, uh, have been around longer and, uh, and, uh, and others later, but we're all 
uh, in this together, so to speak. We're hearing that so much lately, uh, but we are indeed. And so what can I do, whether I'm a, an associate working in senior living, whether I'm a resident living there, whether I'm an older person considering what my next step is going to be in my life, what can I do to, uh, to make this a better experience for, you can make it personal, family members, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, but, uh, you, but for you and for uh, everyone in the world to that, to that extent, that may be, seem like a bit grandiose, but you know, uh, everything in small steps. And uh, who is the uh, sociologist who said, uh, you know, never underestimate what, what one person can, can do, what kind of changes they can make in the world. Forgotten her name, someone must know. I actually quote her in the book, anyway. Anyway, it's a great quote. And so, uh, so I wanted to deal with those two questions. So this part of the book, uh, I, I made some projections that were based upon uh, experts' projections. I made some projections based upon my observations and uh, a little bit of a wish list in this. And I also talked about what uh, we were doing, Masterpiece Living, uh, uh, which is a thread that goes through the book and uh, where we were going and, uh, and already uh, that's due for an update because we have been uh, doing so much and, uh, uh, and we have been uh, making some, uh, we're gonna be making some dramatic uh, additions, refinements and uh, uh, changes in, uh, in, in what we offer older adults. So I'd like to think Masterpiece Living is indeed contributing to that better experience for all. That's always been our desire to do that. So that explains at least a little bit of, of how we got here. And uh, that's, um, hopefully that's the end of the, the soliloquy part of this. This is a book club and everyone like to see everyone participate. Uh, I've always thought, I've hope you've had time to think about those uh, questions. But as Tracy said, if any of you have any additional questions you'd like to deal with. Uh, last week we talked a little, uh, you know, not just a little bit, quite a bit about the COVID-19 world and how can we not because it has radically changed everything and um, you know that that could be part of this also because many of our uh, partners out there in senior living many of the residents out there many of the associates we team members and you know friends and neighbors out there we've all had an opportunity to take a look at our lives and as a society and as individuals uh, and I hope uh, we, uh, we've taken the opportunity to, to really think about in this time to catch our breath, so to speak, what is a value and how do I spend my time? And uh, I said it last, last time, uh, I would be very sad if when all this is over, I, I just go back to my life as it was, as if this never happened. I don't think that will happen, but, uh, and when, and I don't know when that will happen, but I think that I would have missed an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to make uh, uh, some course changes, even if it was just a degree or so. A um, uh, good friend of ours, Katie Sloan said, you know, when, when regarding change, if you just, if you're out there, she's an orienteer, you know, there are people who go out with compasses and, and, and look for things and follow directions. And she said, if, if you're following a compass route, and we know this in aviation, right? Uh, and you just change one degree, you go far enough, you're gonna end in a place way different than where you would have if you just kept to that same course. And all you did is make a very small course correction, but it means a lot in, in the long run, it's huge. And that's, that's the idea of kites and that's the idea of the change that we can all make in this world. So I teed it all up for us. Uh, anyone like to, that the first question, right, is, is about What's that one thing, Tracy, that uh, we might think about? And don't be limited to one, but. Yeah, what's one thing that you would like to change for your children and grandchildren's aging journey? I was just gonna say that I have, uh, I recently was reading the Being Mortal book and he speaks in the beginning of the book, um, on an, I, I can't remember his last name, Atwal Gandhi or Gandhi. Or, <laughs> Um, and he speaks in the beginning of the book about his own, I can't remember if it was his parent or his grandparent experience of growing older. Um, and really just the, the gentleman lived somewhere where his community rallied around him and he may have needed a little bit of support here or there. Um, 
but the the community rallied around him in a way that he was able to be really quite successful in his growing older. Um, and he lived with his family members and all kinds of things. And then they point out in the book that people never make that choice when it comes down to it is they don't make that choice necessarily to live in that community setting with multiple generations of family all living together. They, it, it's just our society keeps pushing for that more isolated feel. And it's just so fascinating now that we've had the coronavirus and to be all, you know, more forcefully isolated, I think, because I think you could still have your own little space and go out and be a part of society when you choose uh, until now. So it's just something I've been thinking about. I think when you say, how can we change it for children and grandchildren? I just think that finding a balance more toward the community side of things and being social is really important. Excellent, Amanda, thank you. Do you have comments on that? I think this is a huge one, Amanda. Um, the, the research is very astounding, actually, that now in this time of social media, uh, the percentage of our population, and particularly the younger population, is lonely. Uh, the loneliness is a scourge. And that isolation, we know, is fraught ultimately with uh, poor statistics regarding chronic disease, everything, dementia, cancer, heart disease, all of it, depression, all of it is uh, much more common when we're not socially connected or we're feeling lonely. And, um, and to, to see that beginning to happen at a much younger age, I don't know if we know the whys or hows, but I, I think our lifestyle is one of them. And uh, compared to the blue zones where people live to be very old, these are places like Atul Gawande's uh, parent, they were in India. And, uh, and that, 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 uh, a village concept, you know, uh, where, where people and, and an intergenerational, which is right how we lived as hunter gatherers forever. And it's natural that we would be healthy and feel good about that. But we seem to be getting away from that. And uh, that is going to be, a, I think, a, well, I think Britain has already acknowledged. I think Canada also, they have appointed a minister of loneliness in the government. They see it as that much of a problem. And uh, that will be associated with huge healthcare problems, psychological problems, uh, violence, early death, uh, so many things. Uh, if indeed people do not feel connected, uh, and again, with the subject we're dealing with, as we get older, it has been the usual path that people get more and more and more isolated. And with that comes all the poor statistics. And when it's not there for some reason, a much, much better uh, healthcare uh, journey and uh, much, much healthier for a longer period of time. Anyone have any suggestions on how we can end this loneliness thing? <laughs> if you did, you could become the minister of loneliness somewhere. <laughs> so, so I was wondering when, when you mentioned the minister of loneliness, uh, does he get to have a staff? It is a it is a relative in Britain. It's a relatively yeah. <laughs> they feel quite lonely in their job, I think. But okay. uh, I I think if she's a young woman, and I don't know what kind of staff she has to answer your literally to answer your question. But uh, I would bet that her job I, it's hard to break through with your uh, agenda, uh, with the rest of the government uh, dealing with things like this COVID, dealing with the economy, dealing with. Brexit and they're in there, you know, but they, uh, they did, they did at least acknowledge a first step that this is a problem and it's something we should address. Um, Denver, uh, we have been uh, able to uh, go to a, a meeting in Denver and I've forgotten exactly, Amanda, you might know what uh, I know Sarah knows for sure, uh, that they have a particular topic, uh, a committee that they have formed and it's all about uh, the aging uh, older adults in in the Denver area, the Colorado actually, it's a state uh, committee. Do you, do you know more, Amanda? I feel like it, it has the acronym. Tracy, you might know. I was just going to oh, say it uh, sounds like um, SPAGA, but I can't think what that acronym yeah, stands SPAGA. for. Yeah. The, 
but they acknowledge now this is a bigger issue than just loneliness but loneliness is a huge and isolation is a huge part of any any attempt to address the quality of life and the aging experience of older adults because it is a major one because it's just the way we live our lives the way we have set up our society the way we view retirement and uh, you know having a very mobile world it is uh, unfortunately uh, inevitable it's the rare it's the rare person that, that doesn't uh, get uh, ultimately in their lives as they progress in years uh, more and more marginalized and isolated and with all the negative things that happen with that. It is the reason why uh, senior living communities, uh, particularly uh, CCRCs, where, or, you know, where they have independent and all, uh, all uh, levels of living uh, are, are popular. Uh, uh, even active adult communities, it's one reason that they're popular because uh, it doesn't always pan out, but they are, they, they market themselves as a way to keep connected with others in a, in a substantive way. And uh, again, I think it's in our very DNA to do that. So I personally, I, I think, Amanda, you, you're, you're right on. I think if, if you wanted to make a big change for the positive, a positive change, that would affect you as a young woman. Uh, your those younger than you, someday kids and grandkids, and 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 just the, the population. We humans. I think if we could address this, how can we keep uh, an intergener a strong intergenerational contact uh, throughout our lives? How can we uh, be? Uh, you know, this this goes to meaning and purpose. Also, how can we? Uh, be connected to the rest of society in a substantive way where we feel we're contributing. We know that in the blue zones, uh, I got it, Danielle, we know that in blue zones, um, if you ask someone how old they are, even a young person will say they're older because to be older is to be revered in an essential part of that society. And these blue zones are where people live to be very old. And so we're studying what is it about them? Well, they're a whole lot closer to the way we've lived for eons before, uh, particularly in this area where the intergenerational contact and, but the older adults realize that they have a major responsibility to contribute to that society. And the other part is the society is just welcoming it. Please bring your mentorship, your guidance, your wisdom. And, and again, they in turn know they have to deliver it. Danielle, did you have something? I was going to uh, say to your point earlier too that it's not just older adults. Some of the the loneliest people are in the millennial group, and to Amanda's point, when we it's it's about what we value, and I'm glad to see it changing. When I went to school, nobody said be nice to each other and play well with others. It was get your education, get a good job. Like it was all about performance, and it's so interesting to talk to. <clears throat> Sarah and other team members and they're saying where they're giving lessons on being kind, being mindful, being respectful. And um, we didn't get those lessons uh, the, the way that they're getting them now. And I think that we also need to value connection. We just haven't. We're starting to. And with the pandemic, we're being forced to. So. Oh, absolutely. I, I think this has been a, a tremendous re reminder of the fact that we need other people. Uh, it's not so much because they make our belts and our food or whatever, because we need them because we need to feel part of something bigger than ourselves and, and to, to be with other humans. I mean, I mean, we've said it before, we wouldn't be here had our ancestors not banded together uh, because the human was not really a, a, a species that would have survived in such a hostile world. But we were smart, but if we were alone, that wouldn't have helped a whole lot. But when we were together, we were awesome. And uh, so that's, those are excellent points, Danielle. Excellent. I want to just jump in here briefly and welcome Jan to the call and Jennifer and Barbara. We, uh, as, as we uh, work our way through this chat, feel free to jump in anywhere if you're not being seen. Um, or her just really wave at the camera. We'll see you, Roger's catching those hands flying and we'll be glad to involve, a, we'd love to have you involved in the conversation as well. 
And with that, I'm just going to add one quick thing. Uh, Dr. Roger, when I was a young girl, I was able to move to Europe with my family. And the first one of the first things I thought was different was people lived in the same home. So three different floors. You'd have your grandparents, the parents, and probably an aunt and uncle or cousins. And everybody lived on a, you know, each family had a different floor, but you were in the same house. You uh, had your meals together. So several of my friends, some of who were German, you know, I was able to experience that and just thought it was wonderful. And it actually reminded me of my grandparents who took care of their parents and lived with their parents as their parents were older. And it seems like quite often we've gotten away from some of that uh, in our society. Well, we do. And uh, I, 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 I'm not sure that it will return at least like that, but we can, as a society, we can, we can act more like an extended family and, uh, and with a, with a village idea, it would seem uh, that would take some doing, but, you know, I think uh, the whole sense of a greater good and a shared experience, uh, it's a, something that this COVID thing has really given us a, a shared experience as a species, a shared experience, something very rare. Uh, and, uh, and with that, uh, you know, hopefully that sharing can give us more of a sense of our, of our connection to others and, and the absolute necessity and, and the idea that it isn't it isn't a doggy dog. It can be, but if your view is that it isn't a doggy dog world, that we're we're all in this together and we can help each other. I mean, I don't want to be Pollyanna about it, but if that is your basic core, I think that's going to take you to a better place than one where you feel everyone's the enemy or trying to get you, or if I don't get mine, uh, if they get theirs, I don't get mine, and that sort of thing. That's the sort of uh, we are seeing with research that's kind of the half full type half empty type of approach and that those people live about seven and a half years less and plus the quality isn't so good <laughs> I, I experienced similar things i lived in germany as you know tracy but for seven years so i did experience that but europe in general i'll j jump in on that germany seems to be the uh common link here. Um, I also spent several years living in Germany as a child and certainly saw that intergenerational um, approach to living uh, along with what both of you will at least recognize is the term they used to say was Gemüslichkeit, which you know was a sense of this being together of um, inclusiveness of um, family of just warmth and it extended far beyond um, related family members it was so that anyone entering the home, the community, the gathering, whatever it was, was meant to feel um, welcomed, included, a part of. Um, I'm, you spoke a little bit earlier about um, the villages or communities, and I think that for many as, of us who are living in um, communities such as, you know, the CCRCs or places that are members of Masterpiece Living, that idea of a village, you know, we're not in the um, multifamily homes we used to be in or even in the longtime family home. We're now living in a, in a different type of community. But I would say that where I am, where I live, um, which you'll see, Peconic Landing. Um, I think we work very hard to be that village for one another. That is one of the integral parts of what MPL is, is um, that we're trying to achieve or trying to just, and not that it didn't exist before it did, but try to show and show to people that, you know, this is a very important part of how you live long, fulfilled, happy, healthy lives is to have that interconnectedness and to include other people. Um, and particularly, as you say, in this time of the pandemic, simple things like the MPL members, you know, called around just to check on people because it is part of your, you know, are you okay? <laughs> Do you need anything? Um, 
Well, well said, Jan. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, I, you're in a great place. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, Christy has a lot to, to do with that. She works very hard. So thank you for that, Christy. Yes. The, uh, that, was, uh, that was our whole goal with Masterpiece Living when we would uh, partner with senior living communities is, is to uh, not so much recreate, but create a culture that was inclusive and uh, was supportive so that, and when we are in those cultures, we know that we grow, we thrive. And, mm. uh, and so that's, that's the idea. Now, as how to do that as a society, I think we're beginning to see some creative things, uh, you know, co-housing. Uh, we're seeing uh, cities become blue zones. That they're trying to duplicate what we see in the original blue zones in some way. Uh, even some big cities like Fort Worth, Texas uh, is uh, uh, doing that. Ireland wants to become a, uh, you know, a, uh, a country that is like that, totally inclusive. Dublin is a city certified, but now they're shooting for the whole country. And uh, of course, they're, they're a pretty uh, uh, gregarious and social country as it is, but, uh, uh, but uh, it, th these are good signs. So, so I, I, I don't certainly have the answers, but I, I think dealing with this whole idea of uh, being isolated and how we, can, how we can structure our society so that is not the automatic, which it is now, pretty much, and that the, mm -hmm. uh, the opposite is true, that people become more uh, engaged or at least as engaged as they were before. Anyone else regarding this, this, this issue of what, you would like to see change uh, for you and for generations after you that would make uh, the, the aging journey, or let's just say life, lifespan, uh, more like a health span, where, where, where for our entire lifespan, where we're as healthy as possible, uh, because certainly the research supports that if we can do it. If not, we can, we can get to the next one, which is probably even going to be a little more sticky. And that is to, you know, what's my, each one of us, that I, uh, my role in uh, changing, making changes or doing something that's going to make the world better. Jonas Salk said he had two goals in life. One is to make uh, the, uh, the world a better place than when he came. And the second was to make, to uh, make the the uh, life experience better, make the human hum, the human race a better race, a healthier race, a happier race. That was his goal. It's it's big, and he he succeeded in doing it uh, with what he did. Uh, but maybe we not we may not experience that kind of success. But what what might we do? And remember, Kaitsen, remember that the smallest little thing can start a momentum, or it can just be in your your little your your area of the world, your environment, and make that a better place. Any ideas on on what that might be? I have I have an observation uh, based on on my experience that that music uh, has been a very much a how can I say an uplifter and motivator for for older folks. I've I've literally seen people in in uh, uh, about to go to sleep in wheel uh, a wheelchair uh, when when exposed to music sort of that they recognize or like they wake up and and almost jump up and start dancing it's amazing absolutely true i know danielle has done a little research on the effects of music you want to chime in on that i was trying to find the article because we just put it up yesterday because there are just so many benefits um you had mentioned memory that, that people recall when they hear music, particularly ones that they like, all of a sudden they're able to tap into to parts of their, their brain that have been dormant. It also makes you more um, creative and it's so great for your immune system. And the thing I found fascinating is when people are listening to music, like when they're either in surgery or whether recovering from surgery, they report less pain and they cut their pain medication. So there's just a ton and I sent the link and it's not like a brag article, but there, we, in it, Sarah and I list a whole slew of, of benefits of music. And um, I think everybody should have music in some way as a part of their life. If any of you have ever been in a drum circle, 
uh, that is a, a very unique experience. One that, I, you know, I said, okay, this is kind of hokey. And uh, we had it at one of our annual meetings at Lyceum. This is kind of hokey. And uh, you sit around and you all have a drum and you just sort of ad lib. You know, no one is doing, there's no background music. No one says, uh, let, let's, you know, let's play this particular song. We just start to beat drums. That is very ancient and primal. I will speak to the drum circles. I worked with many music therapists and certified music practitioners in hospital settings and healthcare settings. But uh, one thing that we were often called to do was we were also contracted out to work with businesses uh, and to see people come together from a business perspective and feel funny about the drum circle. And 20 minutes later, everybody's in a huge circle, pounding away, having a great time. More and more people are coming to join. It, I mean, the power of music and the power of just expression through music and, and community through music is very, very powerful and very healing. Couldn't agree more. I, I, I know that my hokiness, my hokey feeling changed very quickly. I had a, a wonderful time. Yeah, Barbara, I think you wanted to comment as well. Thank oh, you. Yes, uh, first I wanna say hi to Dr. Landry. He probably doesn't remember me, but I have his autograph book. I do. Uh, when, he when he was in Richmond, and I live at Aspire, and the Aspire people had him to come to speak to us, and I have an autographed copy of his book. <laughs> his book. Uh, and I want to say that. Uh, Thank you, Barbara. At, uh, at this at this time, I'm living in Aspire, and I'm 77 years of age. Uh, when I got here, uh, I found that they were looking. They needed someone to teach the bridge class. Okay, so. We have about eight people here now. We're not doing it during the, uh, the, the pandemic. However, we're, we're trying to do it online. But uh, I have about four people who, who knew how to play bridge and about four people who were learning how to play, play bridge. And so this is what I'm doing to help, you know, uh, as I am getting older. I might have said to you when I met you that you've heard of live today like you're going to die tomorrow. But with me, it's learn today like you're going to live forever. So that's what I've been trying to do. But in addition to that, even at this age, I also coordinate a program for senior citizens uh, in a low income area of, of Richmond. And we have, uh, I have been communicating with them remotely uh, because I'm concerned about the isolation also. But uh, when we are together, I really try to provide activities for them, things they've never done before. And um, because, you know, like going to a sit down, uh, uh, to have a catered lunch at lunchtime with the white tablecloths and all of that. So I've been trying to provide those things to people who've not been accustomed to it. And some of the things I plan to do uh, this spring, which we weren't able to do is to go back and play Jack Rocks. You know, the little games we used to play years ago? So I've been trying to do that. On, on the other end, as far as families together, I was fortunate enough to have been a Keizai Koho fellow to Japan in 1992. So I had a chance of living with three different Japanese families. And I remember that in one of the families, grandmother was there, grandfather lived in the house, the children lived in the house and the grandchildren and me. So, you know, I have been exposed to that, you know, in the Japan, in Japanese culture. And uh, I don't think we'll ever probably ever get back to that in our culture, probably never, because we have a different way of living now. But anyhow, I have been exposed to it and it seemed to work just well. There's seemingly more respect for the adults the older ones, when they are in the home with the with the younger ones, more respect for them. So that's it. Well, thank you. Oh, I've read your book. I've read your book almost in its entirety. I sort of live by it. <laughs> well, thank you, Barbara. I'm honored that you did, and thank you for and kudos for what you're doing. And and I know you may not say this. But you feel terrific doing those things. You know, you're making others feel well, but, you know, this resonates with you, too, making you a healthier person. Oh, oh yes. And I also uh, referred this book to someone who's teaching uh, gerontology at Virginia Commonwealth University a couple of weeks ago. Okay, well, thank you. You can be my publicist on the side. So that <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I agree, you know, we're not going to return to the hunter-gatherer or to even the way some of us grew up. 
uh, when we were young. Uh, I grew up in a fairly good sized city, but in the suburbs. And, and so it was, it was basically a very small enclave and, um, uh, I'm lucky. Uh, I still get together with 15 of the of the boys that I grew up with, and uh, we we knew each other when we were before kid you walk around kindergarten. We really started to know each other, and uh, that is a special thing, and you don't see it so much. So the so how can we actually be creative and bring these essential qualities that are necessary for our health, our happiness? our feeling that life is worth living and bring them back into our lives. That's the key and it's connection, it, you know, and the, 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 the connection that comes with music and dance. Uh, also Kay Van Norman, our good friend uh, who ha has a company called Brilliant Aging. She herself is a magnificent dancer and, and uh, she tells us about this and, and uh, you know, that and, the the sense of being part of a of a something bigger than ourselves, to be thinking of the greater good. How can we get these things back in our society? It seems overwhelming, but I think like Kaitzen, like we say, small steps. I think it begins with each one of us. Uh, small thing, but on the bumper sticker of my car, I've got a I've I've got a, a sticker that I found in the Virgin Islands, and it just says, "Be kind." and uh, a small message. And I, I can't tell you how many people have stopped me or, or in a parking lot and said, you know, I, 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 I love so much to see that on your car and uh, thank you. And where did you get it? And that sort of thing. So, uh, so any other, other, I, other thoughts on, uh, on what Barbara said or what music there, Danielle, you got your Not hand music. up. Uh, Amanda sent me a little request because she uh, has some other noise in the room. Barbara, we loved your quote about learn today as if you'll live forever. So we wanted to know if we could quote you. Uh, oh, certainly. On the, okay. And, and actually, I'm glad that Amanda chatted that because that actually um, struck me when you're talking about what you want to change. And I feel like one of the things I, I find that my closest friends, what we all have in common is we're always in school. We're always learning something. And when I meet people who say, oh, look how talented they are. They can do this and they can play the piano. And I'll say, well, why don't you learn? Oh, I'm too old for that. And that drives me crazy. So um, I also, I, I find, I gravitate toward people who learn. So I, you know, I went to a dance class recently where everybody there was at least 25 years younger. They were like 19 year old professional dancers. I didn't do a good job but I was there and I stuck it out <laughs> and I didn't even occur to me till after I'm like, I am like the oldest one here by at least two decades. <laughs> Gil, we've been feeling that for a long time, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, I, I would love to see uh, an environment where uh, as it was for most of the time we've been on earth where we, we looked, and we mentioned it with Blue Zones, where we look to our elders for guidance, for their experience and their wisdom. We, we wanted it. And, and likewise, we felt that responsibility. You know, uh, we certainly have gotten away with that where, where, with our worship of youth. And uh, I, I'd liken it to uh, people, have, my team has certainly heard this, of saving gold for your entire life and having a big stack of gold. And then you get to a point where you just push it aside and you don't use it. Because indeed, that's what we're doing with all this experience. If we were to able to incorporate that, older adults would be better for the youth and the new ideas. I know I am with my team all the time and with my grandchildren. Uh, and then the opposite would be true, where uh, the young wouldn't uh, have to relearn things or uh, think they know everything or, or take a society off the rails uh, with a little bit of input from someone who's been there, uh, who's been through. I mean, th take this pandemic. Uh, we, we have people uh, who have lived, we had a few who lived through 1918, but we have people who lived through um, World War II, the the depression, uh, times when society have uh, really been uh, hit badly and they have uh, survived and they're resilient and they understand. And, uh, and we didn't go to them.
for advice. You know, we were, uh, as a society, we, we were rushing around trying to find answers and doing things, which is all okay, but there's a whole source of experience there that could have helped us. More thoughts uh, on, on anything. Now we have at least another 10 minutes or so, and uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to listen. I do a lot of talking, I'm sorry, but I, I'd like to hear from others. Yeah, you've got your hand raised. Okay. Um, so one of the suggestions that I have is that in my community, like going outside is a big hit for like the older people, just because like when you see like the sun on your skin and like you feel it, like it just makes you feel like you just have a fresh air and like all the things that like in life that is happening right now, like this pandemic, it just goes away for the moment. I agree with you. I think that is so true. The value of nature um and just being in nature and connecting that way and huge huge benefits for our health of getting out and about and you're up in michigan is that correct yes so what opportunities do you have at the community in the winter time there do people bundle up and head out um sometimes like um when like the winter like by christmas time like there's some lights that like we have in rochester it's so, like we go visit the lights or like we like make like have the lights outside so you can go outside and stuff like that it's really pretty cold here um i know that the zoo has their own like their light show stuff you can go to the zoo and see all the lights and the animals at night um you can do like s'mores inside stuff like hot chocolate stuff like that yeah, bringing nature in, and not to point yeah. to Danielle, but Danielle also does a lot of, Danielle gets into everything. You're a naturalist, aren't you? Had naturalist training? It uh, depends. Are you going to quiz me on it? <laughs> I might change my No, I'm not. I'm not, but I know you can contribute to this. <laughs> I, I don't do well impromptu. No, I am a Florida master naturalist, so... Um, and mainly because I wanted to go on nature walks and I'd be like, what's that? What's that? What kind of tree is that? What kind of bug is that? So I, I uh, enjoy picking up those little bits of, and it definitely makes you appreciate nature more when you understand you know, how things are bad, the delicate balance. Well, one of our most stable and happy team members that we have is uh, Teresa who's on and uh, she, she uh, lives in Fresno, California, and surrounded by animals and a whole bunch of almond trees. And uh, she gets probably the biggest nature dose of any of us. And uh, it shows, Teresa. I feel so lucky. <clears throat> my, my internet connection is one of being out in the country today. So sorry for my <laughs> coming and going. Yeah, she, uh, she, she sends me updates. Uh, and she's an almond grower. Uh, as well as being a teammate and uh, take care of horses and dogs and people and uh, but she sends me these these just the pictures of of the trees when they blossom the almond trees when they blossom and she's over the years and it hasn't been all that many years showing how they're growing and then at harvest time she sends me videos of the almonds being harvested so I'm living vicariously uh, at least through the, the agriculture part of nature, through Teresa. So thank you for that. Uh, and why should nature be uh, something that really resonates with us? Huh? <laughs> Someone did a, uh, I, I read, this was amazing. They did a multi-million dollar study to find out what color brings us the most peace. Green. Green. Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> And, you know, when they look at healthcare and uh, trying to make healing environments, they look at those color studies to determine what to paint the walls and try to bring nature in, uh, in any way they can, even if it's just through photographs, uh, through indoor plants, you know, things like that, because of our, our need to be connected to nature. Oh. And, you, and you'd probably say 99.9% .9 of the time on earth, we were directly connected to nature and now we can be locked inside. You got me, Tracy. Tracy, you got me. <laughs> Roger, I'm babbling a lot, so please feel free to cut me off. But um, I was thinking back in Hurricane Maria, I did not realize how uh, attached to nature I was until we had to board up our house. And we don't keep plants inside because our pets will eat them. 
and to not be able to see the greenery, I was immediately stressed out. So I actually had to pull some plants and put them in the garage and put some high up where our animals couldn't reach just so I had a room I could go in and like look at plants. And I thought uh, I did, it was so weird because I'm just so used to being able to go on a nature trail and to not have it even for 24 hours. I'm like, I can't take this. <laughs> Uh, it's absolutely. Uh, I think it's a critical component of our environment if we're going to we're going to age well, and that that's one we can deal with. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a large forest outside your door or 800 almond trees, but you know, sometimes a cactus plant can can do it. You know, to the extent you're connected with that, you pay attention to it, you're mindful of it. Uh, so these are some of the creative things that we need to do. You know, and in this last five minutes, uh, we don't, uh, we have a fairly good uh, uh, group here. Uh, I don't mean good, I mean size. Right? You're all <laughs> high quality. Um, we'd be willing to continue this uh, if uh, people have ideas about how you would like to come together and what topics we might deal with. And they can be related or not related to the book or just related to. Uh, things, uh, you know, Teresa and Danielle and I do a podcast and we, we raise issues uh, on that podcast and we could discuss things like that after we listen to a podcast. We can do a number of things if there is interest. Anyone? Yeah. Slight, slight, a slightly different subject here. Um, for, for aging well, this is kind of a question. Uh, if, if, Someone had a, a health situation. Now, as we get older, our health deteriorates just as, an, as a normal thing. So we have to, we have to uh, come up with ways to deal with that. But let's say that uh, uh, someone has a situation where um, they've got a, a health issues that, that cause them to uh, deteriorate at a much, how can I say, a much faster rate, a much um, much more debilitating than the, than the average uh, the, the average old situation. How does that how does that individual uh, maintain the aging well uh, aspect of things? Well, first of all, if you're a hundred and that happens, congratulations, you've lived long and you're going to die short probably. But to the extent that someone has uh, you know a chronic condition that is uh, causing this decline, uh, it's uh, it's definitely a challenge. And I've got a whole team who, uh, who, who can address this. But, you know, the, I think the important thing is to realize that you can, as long as you have a pulse, you can grow in some way. Uh, and look, let's take the life of Stephen Hawking. Here's someone totally paralyzed except for his lips at age 29, told he would probably only live a year. He just recent last year, I think, died in, uh, I'm not sure, 70s he was. Uh, and uh, and yet you know, also was able to contribute to the to our knowledge of the of the universe scientifically. Now he used tech, he used high tech, he was in a supportive academic environment. But I, I think that that's the key. You, you have to be somewhere. You have to be in an environment that believes what I just said, that believes no matter what your impairment may be that there's always some accommodation that where you can do an end run around something. And even if there is a wall that you can't get around, which is rare, that you can grow in other areas. You know, there, there's your physical self, yes, but there's your intellectual self, there's your social self, there is your spiritual self in the sense of finding meaning and purpose and helping uh, others. My mother got to a point where she could do very little, but she could knit and she knitted hats for children or, and then dolls for children in, in disaster areas throughout the world, which gave her a sense of meaning and purpose and brought some high quality. I'll stop there because I know there's others on my team and out there who have something to say about that. Team? Um, I think Jan had, had a comment on that as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, before you mentioned Stephen Hawking, I was going to say um, my husband became very ill very quickly um, and did not did not live for a very long time after his illness began. And he, um, like Stephen Hawking, had ALS, um, which happened very suddenly and he deteriorated very rapidly. 
And one of the first things that was impacted for him was his ability to speak. So it was very difficult in many, many ways um, for someone who was, you know, I'm, I'm uh, not objective at all, you know, brilliant individual and a very loving, compassionate, warm, full of life type of person to lose that ability was very difficult. But when it got to the point where he was much more uh, physically involved, it would have been very easy for him to sort of curl up in a ball. And instead, we had a routine where every day, if I saw things were looking a little um, difficult, I would just say to him, you know, look, the reality is you're not going to die today. So here are three options. These are the three things we can do today. You pick. Because you're still alive and we still have a life together. So choose what you want to spend your time on. And it was sort of our way of just refocusing on the positive because there were still many positives. Well, Jan, that's so poignant. And thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, uh, that was an experience that was very difficult, but yet in some ways rewarding for you in the sense of uh, the compassion and uh, the knowledge and the wisdom and, and that you just your ability to share that experience with us. We, we, I, we know we can see it's still hard for you and uh, thank you. He had you, he was so fortunate. Uh, and uh, I think it's very critical that we, you know, we can, we can gird our loins, so to speak, and gut it out and deal with something. But if we're, we absolutely need others. We need a supportive environment. We need a we need people, you know, a spouse. But even even more than a spouse, because that is, as I'm, ch- I'm telling you, anything you don't know, Jan, that is so demanding on a spouse. Frequently, the spouse passes before the the person with a disease, say with dementia or ALS, or because that that is so demanding on on uh, on the caregiver. And so it's very important that we be in places where there is a whole environment, first of all, that believes in the value of that person, that they can choose, that they can still do things to assist them in uh, overcoming some of the impairments. And and just just to be in a place where where you're not looked at as broken. You're looked at as someone, a human like all of us, and we all have our times when we're uh, we're challenged. And and as a group, as a culture, we can assist you in doing what you want to do and accommodate when you can. Uh, and uh, we see that so much in all the communities that we work with. And I don't think anything, team, tell me if I'm wrong, anything gives us more pleasure than to hear stories of um, someone like you, Jan, who's been through that with your husband or who personally have been through things and say to us, I just don't know what I would have done had I not been with all of these friends and uh, and in a, in a place where they they supported me and believed in me and uh, and helped me accommodate us. Uh, that and is- I, I think that that partially goes back to some of the earlier comments we said about living this multi generational lifestyle and knowing that there are other people out there and um, again where we happen to live, we made this move very quickly um, because we knew something was going on. We didn't know what. Um, And it was the best move possible because then there was better quality of life for both of us. And you, um, as you suggest, there's still some pretty, some pretty wonderful moments that come out of it. And I know that for um, many of the, um, like the management team actually here at Peconic Landing, one of the funny stories that they still tell and I hope will tell for years is that uh, around Christmas time, we had a concert um, out here and it was one of the elementary schools had come to do their performance and they did it by grade level. And we were all in the auditorium. My husband was in a wheelchair by then. So we were sitting near the back because I wanted to be able to Um, move him quickly if it became uncomfortable for him or too much or whatever. So I was standing behind him or sitting behind him. And um, part of what 
went along with it is he kind of lost a few of the inhibitions. And so when the first grade violin group got up to perform, um, you can imagine um, how melodic that part of the concert was. Um, I could see his shoulders starting to move. You know how we all try and we laugh and we were quiet, but our shoulders and so, and then came, at a, or maybe it was third grade started and then second grade and first grade. By the time we got to first grade, he just couldn't contain it any longer. And he was laughing out loud so hard <laughs> that the rest of us were all laughing and the tears were running down our face because we were trying so hard not to laugh because we thought, these poor children doing this performance are just up there giving it their all. And it sounded like, you know, six cat in an alley type of thing. <laughs> and it, it, it was just, it, you know, this moment where everybody sort of lost it. And because he wasn't quiet and I was trying to, at one point, I, I think I put my hands, I know I did. I put my hands over his mouth and I was trying to say, you know, honey, you can't do this. These poor little kids are not gonna understand. And the rest of the crowd, and I don't know, you know, Chrissy's on here, and I don't know whether she can, um, she was, I don't remember whether she was there or not, but um, several of the directors um, who were here, they had to leave the auditorium because they were all laughing so hard, but they were really laughing because of David's reaction, not these little children up on the stage. Of course, we were thoroughly enjoying it is because these kids were playing with such abandon and they were so happy and delighted with what was going on. And um, yeah, humor. Marvelous. <laughs> Marvelous story. That's another one, right? Music, humor. Humor is important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think humor is essential. Yeah. You know, well, I, I, I oh, go ahead, Dr. Roger. I was just going to say this has been successful because we don't really want to leave, but we don't want to go over our stay, so to speak. My grandmother used to say, don't overstay, you're welcome. <laughs> well, and I want to say thank you to everybody. You know, this hour has been fun and refreshing. And the topic was where do we go from here? And just to recap some of the things that you brought to the call, uh, which I think is, you know, just uh, inspiring is, is connecting socially uh, music and the arts, learning, continuing to learn, learn today, never stop, you know, the value of nature, um, sharing between generations, laughter and humor, and then our outlook. So I think those, ra those are great areas when we say, where do we go from here? We just bring all those things back in, almost back to the 10 tips, Roger, plus any extras we discussed last week, you know? Absolutely, so I think Tracy. Yeah. I thank each of you for contributing and throwing your hat in the ring on the call today. And we look forward to uh, hearing more from you. If, if you would talk to your partnership specialist, if you'd like more of this type of thing, or if you'd like to start your own book club, we'd be glad to support you. Um, Gil and Sandy, you know, talking to your connection there at Acacia Creek, if you want to, you know, look forward to something like this again in the future or just more things that they can connect you to. Um, we'd be glad to follow up with any of you. So thank you very much, Tia, Jan, Sandy, Gil, uh, and the rest of the team here on the call today, especially to Dr. Roger. Well, thank <laughs> you. Writing the book so we could discuss it. Made my day. Appreciate it all. And Tracy, thank you for being our leader. You're our magnificent leader today. <laughs>